And we now have the next speaker and perspective from Dr. Per Olsson. He's also a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. He's leading the, SR, the, the research stream called Resilience Science for Transformation. And he's working with agency and system entrepreneurship, social ecological innovations and transformations to say sustainability. So, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, it's such a privilege to be here to speak today. And I want to thank you for the, for the invitation to do that. Uh, I'm, going, I'm here to talk about capacities for transforming towards um, stewardship, but I also want to start on a, on a personal sort of note to you, Terry, because as has been said here before, you have been such a role model to many of us. I just want to say that again, emphasize that, and the, the role you have had um, uh, to many of us. And I think that uh, to me, uh, when I came into this 20 years ago, um, uh, into a space of transdisciplinarity, it was a quite a hard space sometimes because transdisciplinarity challenges many of the structures of, of academ academia and, and universities. So it was, it was such a, uh, it was so important to have um, prominent researchers like yourself, uh, Eleanor Ostrom and Francis Wesley and Carl Folke also to have, to pave the way for us but also to, to have someone to hold on to. And it's, I, agree, I agree with what has been said here before that, uh, and your personality of being such a humble, uh, curious and, and wise uh, person. It also, I, I agree with what Therese said, that you, you always take in a genuine interest in what we're doing. And that's a, that's a, that's a great thing. And I, I want to thank you for that. And I'm really happy that you have gotten this prize. Um, so um, with that said, um, I'm going to talk about uh, transformations. And uh, we have heard uh, here a lot about um, sort of the, the precarious situation that we're in, the, the, uh, some of the doom and gloom scenarios, some of the realities happening at the moment with, with, uh, with forest fires, etc., cetera, around the, around the globe. And, and, and a lot of the research that sort of talks about the state of the planet is um, also saying, stating the need for transformation. We need transformation. But what, we, what I want to talk about here today is that how do we move from just saying that we need transformation to understand how they actually happen? And that's why I wanted to talk about uh, transformative capacity the capacities involved in navigating transformative change. And when I talk about transformation, I mean a very specific type of change. And Terry and Carl and others here in the room have been instrumental in, in sort of making the distinction between transformation and other types of, of, of change, including adaptation. So when I talk about uh, adaptation, I basically mean uh, the ability to stay on track in the, in the face of uncertainty and change. Transformation is the ability to change trajectory in the face of uncertainty and change. And when I talk about transformation, and this is also the literature on transformation, the literature on transformation, sort of more general than social ecological system, they talk about that transformation has to Im involve change, a fundamental change in, in, in a range of dimensions. So one that is often talked about is, is a fundamental change in power relations. So that means who is deciding what and how. A fundamental change in resource flows, who's getting what and how. Uh, roles and routines, who is doing what and how. This is yeah, and here illustrated by a man panel at, the, at the, a global summit for women. <laughs> and, and, uh, and the last one that we talk about a lot too is, uh, is a fundamental change in values, beliefs and, and worldview. And we heard that today also. And it also, transformation also involves um, changes at multiple levels. 
So you hear that sometimes, the micro level, the meso level, or the macro level. Or as transition management or transition theory talks about niche uh, regime and landscape. And that means that change has to happen at the practice level. And practices that are embedded in rules and regulations that also has to change. But those rules and regulations are often embedded in, in values and beliefs and worldview that also fundamentally has to change. So transformation is a change at all these levels. And transformation involves building new practices, rules and regulations, and develop new worldviews and values. But it also involves breaking down what's not working, breaking down uh, or unlearning or, or getting rid of practices that are, 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 um, are creating um, unsustainable trajectories. But the same with rules and regulations and, and worldview and values. So this is, so transformation is, is um, both about a breakdown and a build up. And in, in, uh, in transformation, in the discussions out there, it's often, we often talk a lot about the, the new and, and building the new without discussing enough what has to go and the processes of that. And, and there's agency involved in that. And we talk about agency also at these different levels. So we're trying to understand what is the role of, of uh, individual and organizations or change makers or champions or whatever you call them at these levels. So that's also something that we focus all, a lot on and understanding that. And that's what stewardship is, I think, to you also, Terry, is that it's a concerted action. <laughs> Of, of people working at all these levels, both with the build-up, but also with the breakdown. And th in the literature, this is talked about in, uh, in, uh, or referred to as, as, as um, uh, distributed agency, or we use the concept of system entrepreneurship. So, um, we also uh, talk about, when it comes to capacities, and. Uh, Terry has mentioned this already without the, the, the stability domain. So we use the, the concept of uh, 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 a basin of attraction to help us understand transformative change. And that's what you talked about already, that, that trans transformations involve these different phases and, and that you might have a, have a window of opportunity when suddenly you can, you can move from one system that is stable with the self-reinforcing feedbacks to another system with a different feedback uh, loop. So what we also talk about then is that each of, these, uh, each of these phases involves specific capacities. And it's important to understand those capacities so you do the right thing at the right time. So one thing is about... Uh, the capacities for pre preparing the change, preparing the system for, for transformation. The other one is about capacities that involve uh, navigating that threshold or that uh, uh, sometimes people talk about tipping points, but that sort of navigation process. And then capacities for stabilizing and building the resilience of the new system. So this, this, is, the, this is sort of the framework that that we use, and an example of, it's interesting to see then, what happens if you're missing a, a capacity? And I think when I talk about that, I sometimes use the example of the Arab Spring, because a lot of people are familiar with that. And, and it's also linked to, the, to what you talked about before, also the, uh, a movement, and the role of a movement. And in all of those seven cases of Arab Spring, in all those seven countries, uh, all of them were successful of breaking the system, getting to the point where the regime said, we're going to let go. But none of them were successful in navigating the transition into democracy. Tunisia was the closest. That's what people have written a lot about. And, but in most cases, it, was, it, it took another turn because the, the capacity to navigate that space wasn't there. So what, for example, to handle all the conflict that happened in that space, because 
what happens, and it, this is the case in, in several movements that we can look at uh, historically, is that groups that were together in, the, in, the, in, in trying to break the system start to fight in this phase, in the middle phase, because they are slightly different ideas of what direction is, it needs to be taken. So this is, this is the... This is the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the, this theory, I would say, and the framework uh, is based on a lot of like uh, cases that at the very local level. So the, the understanding is based on a lot of our research on neighborhoods, communities, sometimes at national level. So. Uh, for example, we have this, uh, the, the seeds of a good Anthropocene uh, projects that uh, Gary and others, I saw Gary before, Gary Peterson, but others are involved in here uh, at the center, which start to collect all these and start to do comparative studies of these transformative changes at the sort of the local level. But one of the challenges that we're dealing with is, is how can all these good things going on at the very local level have an impact at scales that matters in the Anthropocene? Can, how can it start to see the, that all that good stuff going on have an impact at, for example, the global negative trends of the Earth system? That's the question that we're dealing with. So we have to understand how, how that happened. And a couple of years ago, we were a couple of um, um, researchers that started to explore other cases, historical cases, of large-scale transformations where an idea had have a large-scale impact. So we had a, several case studies, and some of them you see there, like neoliberalism and financial derivatives, national park systems, uh, etc., and some of the women movements, especially around uh, uh, reproductive justice and, and birth control. So this gave us a chance to look at these large-scale uh, uh, transformations to understand a bit and explore the speed, the magnitude and direction of transform uh, transformative change. And <clears throat> what we found uh, that changing practices, rules and regulations and values at that very large scale level takes something about six, 60 to 200 years. And that's a, then a challenge then now when we have 12 years to act, as, as uh, is often reported. So how can we act, uh, how can we speed up these, these, um, these transformations? That's a, that is a, a, a one of the challenges and something that we're, we're, um, we're exploring at the moment. So this is also to finish then. It is... Um, many uh, projects out there, initiatives, alliances, to try to, to, uh, to act on the Anthropocene challenges at scale. So, an important issue there that is more of a question is how can these, these initiatives then help us change systems and transform systems instead of just solving problems? as we talked about here, or come up with solutions. How can they change systems? And because we need to change the system that created the problems in the first place. And these are philanthropy organizations and, and companies and others uh, that wants to take on the stewardship challenge. But they can have very perverse effects, like, like uh, well, some people, maybe, maybe some in the audience say, oh, that's perfect, you know. Um, that, uh, that they are willing to patent uh, autonomous robot bees, uh, also called pollination uh, drones, uh, because we are helping uh, provide that ecosystem service. But this, this is a bit scary to me, that one company will be so dominant in one of the, um, one of, uh, one of the key ecosystem services in the world. So just to finish then, with a couple of thoughts uh, or when it comes to the capacities that we need to navigate these sort of large-scale transformations. And the first one is navigating conflict and pushback because there's always a pushback 
if you're doing trans something transformative, there will be a pushback from the status quo. So you have to have a capacity to, to deal with that. Especially if you have to accelerate the breakdown. That's going to upset a lot of people. And we see that already in the, in the Future for Fridays movement, around what's happening around that too. Uh, handling emergent and surprises as part of dealing with complex systems. Being able to be reflective of ourselves and how transformations affect those voices that aren't always heard. That's, we, we talked a lot about that already, Marie and, and Terry. And uh, dealing with un, un anticipated consequences that are inevitable. And this is also to say that even projects and innovation and solutions uh, with good intentions can have perverse effects because we're dealing with complex systems. So there is a sh uh, some people say that every innovation has a shadow. And then the last one is the capacity to scale out and up, but also deep. That, that uh, it also has to include this fundamental shift in value systems. So that's, that's where I uh, stop. Thank you very much.